Hi, welcome to Quantum Action. My name is Fabrizio Poli. I'm your host. Uh, today we're going to be going into an interview which is focusing on, you know, as you know, the Action Cube, A-C-T-I-O-N, the C, the cash, money, business. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about buying businesses with no money. So I met with Jeremy Harbour. He's an entrepreneur based in Singapore. Very interesting guy, a multimillionaire. How he started his career, he's going to be sharing his story with us all and telling us how he buys businesses with no money. He then tell us all about the Harbour Club and how the Harbour Club works and can work for you as well. Very interesting, he's going to be talking about his shareholder value approach to business, which is very, very interesting. And he's going to be sharing also some information about uh, where he sees the markets going in the future, the business opportunities that are out there. Uh, very, very interesting. I do encourage you to stay on for the whole interview, not only because it's full of incredible information, which is going to be a great value to you. Uh, I mean, I learned something and, 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 and got a really mega idea as a result of talking to Jeremy. And we had quite a long conversation after the interview. And as a result, we've got something cooking, uh, which you will find out in the next few months. Um, but apart from that, if you do hang in here at the very end, Jeremy has a surprise for all of you. So hang in because it's a really, really great surprise. And uh, so let's get into it. Let's go to Singapore to meet with Jeremy Harbour. Off we go. Yeah. Okay, Jeremy, welcome to uh, Quantum Action. And um, let's start right away here with, uh, tell us a bit about how you got into business because your story is very unconventional. You didn't go to the usual, down the usual business school route. Tell us a bit about how you got into business and, and your upbringing in, and, 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 and off you go. Yeah, so I guess I guess the, 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 the big break that I had or the luckiest thing that I had was having two self-employed parents. Um, so my dad was a farmer and my mum ran a small beauty salon in the in the house that we lived in. And I think what that demonstrated to me, because when I was hanging out with all the other kids at school, I think the general idea was, OK, am I going to work for the government or am I going to work in industry or private business in some way? You know, and, and it didn't seem like anyone had this third option open to them. And I've, I've seen very clearly that there is a third option, and the third option is you can do whatever you want, um, which actually seemed way more appealing to me than, uh, than the capacity I was doing. I'd be selling everything at school. Um, I remember, you know, about seven years old, cutting my parents' flowers down and putting them in jam jars and selling them to people on the, uh, on the street outside. Um, uh, yeah, I always got involved in those sort of little things. But I actually started a proper business when I was about 14 years old. And I was um, I was buying watches and jewelry from an importer from China um, and selling them on a market stall at the weekends and basically making quite good money doing that. Um, and so very quickly, I wanted to leave school and just get on with that. And so I did my GCSEs. I'm a June baby. So I managed to finish my GCSEs just before my 16th birthday and left school straight after the last exam and pursued that that business. So I effectively left school at 15 and pursued this business, um, uh, basically buying wholesale blocks of uh, yeah, watches and jewelry and selling them to other market traders and on a market stall uh, myself. That, that evolved into another business, as most businesses do. You start as one thing and it evolves into something else. And I won't, I won't go into it now, but I ended up supplying amusement machines to pubs and clubs and takeaways and eventually owning an amusement arcade. That went horribly bust when I was 18. And, uh, and that was probably a really useful thing because actually up until then, most things I'd done had kind of worked, yeah. which is very unusual in business yeah. because most things in business don't work out. Um, but yeah, I then went on and started the telecoms business. Um, and that was what really got me into kind of M&A and, uh, and, and the kind of the, the path that I'm on now, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so how did you develop the idea for the Harbour Club? Tell us a bit about the Harbour Club and what it does, because it's yeah. very unique what you've created here. And everybody that's been on your courses, and, and Max Lundqvist, a, a, a friend of mine that, that's been on your courses, uh, speaks highly of you and, and, and the courses and how it's really helped him in business. So tell us a bit about the yeah. Harbour Club. I mean, it, it, it's fantastic to be able to sell something that gets such rave reviews and changes so many people's lives. I get messages every day from people thanking me for what they've learned and the experience that they've, they've got from it. It's really humbling sometimes, but it's actually kind of accidental. So 
the history was I started a telecoms company. Um, we grew quite quickly. After about two years, we were doing over a million in revenue. And telecoms is just very acquisitive as, a, as an industry. So if you think about two telecoms companies, all of the operating functions are duplicated. So if you put the two together, you can basically get rid of the operations of one and, and there's a really big increase in profit. So an acquisition strategy in a telco is almost like the second engine on a plane. Um, you know, everybody has one. It's yeah. kind of, uh, you have your organic strategy and your acquisition strategy. So as a, a telco business owner, I was exposed to all these people trying to buy me. Um, and what was really fascinating was the one thing they all seemed to have in common is that they weren't going to give me any money, or they certainly weren't going to give me any money up front. It was all clever deal structures and jam tomorrow and solving problems and, and things like that. And so after having a number of these pitches or meetings or whatever you want to call them, I kind of decided, well, you know what, I haven't got any money either. Maybe I should be the buyer instead of the seller. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and basically mm -hmm. used what I'd learned from those meetings to go and buy a telecoms business. And, and I bought a telecoms company down the road. It was a little mobile phone company. It had been going for 13 years. It had a thousand active uh, uh, customers. One of the customers was Nintendo. Um, so you know, it's really nice yeah. uh, customers in there. I did that deal yeah. without using any money up front. And basically, uh, I didn't have any money up front. And that was probably one of the real benefits I had. Because if I'd had some cash, yeah. I probably would have given it to yeah. them. But yeah. because I didn't have any yeah. cash, I kind of stuck to my deal structure, which was nothing up front and, and, and jam tomorrow, and ended up getting that deal done. And I often say to people that, you know, right now I teach a course on how to buy companies without using cash or debt. Um, had, I, had I had money at that time, I'd probably be teaching a, a course on how you can buy businesses, but you always have to give them a bit of cash. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so how did you structure the deal with this guy? So instead of paying him up front, you said, I'll pay you as we go. Absolutely. I mean, that was a really small, really simplistic deal where we just paid them as we migrated the customers over. So. Yeah. It was basically, it come you, as we recontract them with us, we'll pay you a commission. And we were receiving a commission from the mobile operator, so it was a net positive activity for us anyway. Um, so, I mean, it would just be described as an earn out if you were looking as a, yeah. you know, for a description. Yeah. That was a very simple, my first deal, very yeah. simple transaction. Um, but it taught me an incredible lesson because we grew by a year's worth of sales in an afternoon. Um, I didn't have any sales or marketing costs. I didn't have any capital at risk. Um, uh, it was like a huge epiphany. It was like I didn't have to run the marathon. I could just run the last 10 yards and they still gave me a medal. Um, and it was uh, and it was such a game changer in, in my mind. Actually, two weeks later, I bought an IT company using a very similar methodology. And I ended up doing 12 deals over, well, 11 deals, taking up to 12 companies over the over the next 18 months. It was kind of like a, a champagne cork popping, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and I was off to the races kind of thing. And... Um, uh, and that, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, very, very fascinating. Anyway, because I was buying these companies for nothing uh, or for no cash and no debt, yeah. I started to get a bit of a reputation, yeah. particularly when I would buy companies other people were looking at buying and I would end up winning the deal and I wasn't paying anything for it. So there was one I remember particularly, yeah. it was a three and a half million pounds revenue um, uh, training and development company. Um, and I just bought, uh, there was another two buyers looking at it and I bought it and I bought it with no money up front and they were both dying to know how the hell i had done that because this was a major investor for them that I'd just taken out of the, you know, taken out yeah, of the way. Maybe, also maybe, Jerry, maybe those guys uh, have been to Harvard. Maybe well, so to most people, school. what they do is they follow, they, they follow the corporate way of doing things. So they learn, you know, they do an MBA or they read a book about M&A and all books about M&A are written by advisors. So the advisors say, get loads of advisors. Um, and of course, when you have loads of advisors, you have people that are paid by the hour. So guess what? Law of incentives. It takes lots of hours. Um, and they just end up caught in this kind of, I call it the buggers muddle where you're not really making any progress, but you've got lots of people you're having to pay and, and you don't, you, the deals don't get done. So it's very easy for somebody like me to swoop in, give them, you know, get the deal done and swoop out while they're still kind of pissing around, putting their trousers on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I, uh, I, I, I was getting a bit of a reputation for doing these deals and more and more people were asking me to either be a consultant or some sort of non-executive role in their company. And the deal was normally, look, we'll pay you grand a year to come and sit on our board and you can help us buy companies for nothing. And I was thinking, why on earth would I want to do that? If I find a company I can buy for no money down, I'll just buy it and I'll sell it for six or seven figure uh, upside. Why would I want that as a job when I can just do it for myself? So I kind of dismissed it. Um, but, you know, it's always a bit annoying when somebody wants to give you money, but you can't think of a good way of taking taking that money. You know, it's kind of a, it did frustrate me. 
And then when I bought that training and development uh, uh, company, I realized that actually that might be the secret to the, uh, or the solution to the problem, which is why not teach people how to do it. Then if they want to join venture with you and work with you, they can. If they want to go and do it on their own, they also can, because it's a massive universe of potential deals out there. There's no way I'm doing uh, all of them. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I really looked at it as a way of how to deal with these people that were asking for advice. Um, and so uh, I was at one of these seminars that was run by the company that I just bought. And I was writing, I remember writing on a, on a piece of paper, I had two working titles. One was the Harbour Club yeah. and the other was yeah. Harvard Business School. Um, which was obviously a, a play on <laughs> words. Uh, the Harbour Club's probably slightly less likely to get me sued, so yeah. I went with the Harbour Club. Yeah. Um, and basically, I designed a, a course uh, on how to buy and sell companies. And, and um, immediately, somebody that was at that thing was looking over my shoulder and said, what are you writing? And I explained it to them. They explained that they'd sold a company two years ago and were trying to buy one and they and I said what are you doing to buy one and they said oh well I've contacted a load of brokers I'm getting a load of information I said whoa whoa whoa, whoa. okay never deal with brokers complete waste of time all the numbers are fabricated all the sellers are um you know have unrealistic expectations yeah. what you need to do is x yeah. y and z and he said okay how much is your course and I went uh 35 grand um and he said okay I'll come because <laughs> um he'd spent uh, he'd spent more than that already on advisors not buying companies so he felt he may as well come so anyway, we actually did, and you'll like this, we, uh, the first course was uh, four people. We flew in a private jet down to Saint Tropez yeah. um, just to raise everybody's yeah. game. So, uh, and that worked really well. Uh, one of the guys actually said he was, uh, his goal was to get an Aston Martin for 200 grand. Now he needed 11 million for a jet. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> raised his aspirational levels a little, uh, a little bit. Yeah. But we went down to Saint Tropez and did the first Harbour Club. And basically, I had to figure out how to teach what it was that I was doing. Now, when you're just doing it yourself, you don't really understand the process behind what you do. You kind of flitter around from deal to deal, conversation to conversation. Some you win, some you lose. But you don't really ever spend time to sit down and figure out what it is exactly that you do. And so teaching it to people, I had to break it down into a process. And that, that process of breaking it into a process was fascinating because it actually taught me how to do what I, what I was doing. And it also showed me all the things that I'd done before that had worked that I hadn't done again. Um, so there were a whole load of things that, that uh, yeah, were kind of quick wins that could be implemented that would get more deals and more uh, traction. So anyway, I did the first Harbour Club. That was back in 2009. Um, I did three shortly after that. And then I realized that in 2009, I did 12 deals personally. And all of them had come from uh, introductions from people that had done the Harbour Club. I hadn't found any organic deals myself because I've been yeah. doing the Harbour Club and yeah. working on the deals that people were bringing me. Yeah. And, that was when the, yeah. and that was when the penny dropped that actually this is more instead of just trying to charge people money for training, this could be a really powerful community. Yeah. Um, so we dropped the price yeah. substantially. Um, I mean, it's now at the time of uh, talking, it's about 9,000 US dollars to do the course instead of the original 35 grand. And it's... Um, uh, it's a three-day intensive kind of boot camp, and then uh, we also have a community. So we have our own app, um, which is an iOS and Android app, uh, mm -hmm. where we post loads of bonus content. We post case studies. Um, you can meet other members. You can find people in different jurisdictions. There's loads of masterminding groups within there that people can join, and all of that is at no cost. So we're not like a traditional training company where we teach you a little bit of it, and then we try and sell you the next thing and the next yeah. thing and the next thing. Yeah. You pay a half membership. Yeah. Everything's included. The community... Uh, is there for you. Um, it's, a, it's a really active, really buoyant uh, uh, community. And it, it's all kind of come about by accident. And I mean, we're now, you know, when we do events now, we have, um, you know, some really, it's just a room full of really great people because, uh, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurs, they're looking to do deals, they've got a whole range of skills and experience. So it's a fabulous network. It's so how, really how many people do you have on each course? Do you have a restriction? Well, it really, it, really varies, it really varies where we do it. So um, typically in the US, it's around about 70, 80 um, people. Um, in the UK, they're sometimes a little bit bigger. In Singapore, they're a little bit smaller. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, depends, um, yeah, it depends where we're doing them. But, uh, how, how um, many do you do a year? Yeah, how many, uh, how many I, are you doing a year? Uh, I, 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 yeah, so um, we always used to do five a year, um, but we've just increased that to 10 a year because we started doing the US last year. So we've got three events in the US now uh, this year. Um, so we're going to do 10 in total this year, which will be the most we've ever done. Um, and uh, and I, I'm, it's an immersive course. I'm with everybody for the whole three days. So it's breakfast, lunch, dinner every day in a hotel. 
I'm I'm with everybody, so everybody gets to meet me and hang out with me and talk about uh, the deals and stuff. We we there's a Q and A app, um, and we get through every question that everybody has in the room. Um, and then there's also tons and tons of follow up. So we you know we have uh, everybody has my Skype, my WhatsApp um, directly uh, for questions about deals or for joint ventures. We have the uh, we have the app itself. Um, where we've got a load of Harbour Clubbers who are very experienced in doing deals that people can ask questions and bounce off as well. Um, and then there's these mini communities. So, for example, there's a women's group, there's a southwest of England group, there's a London group, a Birmingham group, a Manchester group, a southern states of the US group, a Texas group, a New York group, a, um, yeah, a, um, a leveraged buyout group, um, you know, a whole all, all these different things. And they, they often have Zoom calls together or the London one does a face-to-face meetup once a month. Uh, so does the, the southern UK one. Uh-huh. Um, so there's all these other kind of things going on all the time to help people just break their deal virginity, basically, and get started on the on the journey. Because it, it is about popping that cherry because once you've, once you've done it, it's kind of, uh, uh, it gives you that confidence and competence to go and do yeah. Do it again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in one of your uh, videos, you talk about 10,000 people retiring every day in America. Um, and this is an unprecedented opportunity to buy businesses. And a lot of these people are baby boomers, uh, which obviously yeah. is the majority of the population. Tell us a bit about this climate and, and give us some insight on, on, on onto this opportunity. Because it's not only in the US, is it? This is happening yeah, it's all over. Yeah, this is where, I mean, uh, so there's a really interesting metric, which is the, uh, the the time when adult diapers or nappies start to outsell children's diapers or nappies. And the first country for that to happen was Japan. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, and then after Japan, it was, uh, I think it was Australia. Yeah. Um, and then New Zealand and Singapore is now there. UK is now there. US is now there. Canada is now there. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a frightening statistic, isn't it? Adult nappies outselling baby uh, baby nappies. But yeah. it's that demographic cliff. It's the fact that there are more old people than there are young people. Uh-huh. Now, that presents a really interesting opportunity because what a lot of people, I think, don't realize is that in all those mature economies that I've just mentioned, yeah. small to medium-sized businesses represent about 50% of GDP. So they are a huge chunk of the economy are these companies that employ less than 200 uh, people. Mm-hmm. And there's a massive percentage of those companies that are owned by the baby boom generation, the ones that have to buy in the next 10 years or so or yeah. start dying soon. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the next generation for the first time in history is smaller than the last one. Uh, and also, they have very different ambitions and desires and things that they want to do. So, you know, your average millennial would want a blockchain business or a marijuana business or an app. Um, they're not so interested in a lift engineering company or, a, you know, uh, engineering business or, a, you know, uh, air conditioning company or something like that. So um, there isn't a natural pool of buyers to these businesses. And people always say, oh, what about venture capital, private equity, all that sort of stuff? Well, private equity um, now kicks in at 100 million plus. There are some firms that deal with smaller deals, but the smaller deals they look for are in those sexy industries that have got the potential for that hockey stick growth. The, the businesses that actually do everything that we need every day um, uh, that are a bit unsexy, uh, are um, don't, don't have that many opportunities open to them. And in fact, if you look, there's a website in the US called bizbysell.com, and they publish a report every year into businesses being sold. And the things, the interesting things from that are only about 10% of the companies that are listed uh, are unlisted after a year, which means that, and they might not be unlisted because they sold, they might be unlisted because they decided not to be listed anymore. So that means not a lot of the businesses that are being advertised are selling. Um, if you're being generous, it's 10%, um, but it's probably a lot less than that. And then if you look at the ones that are selling, you know, something like an engineering business will be selling for 1.6 times earnings. Well, 1.6 times earnings, if you're an old retiring person, it's act- you're actually better off just slowly running the business down into the ground. So as people... Uh, you know, retire, you don't re-employ, you, you know, you just make do, you don't replace machinery, you don't update things, you don't invest in R&D, and over a three to five year period, you just, you know, gently glide to the scene of the crash and then close the doors. Well, then you've had five years of profits out of the thing instead of 1.6 times um, uh, profit. But one thing that the baby boomers uh, do uh, care about sometimes is their legacy. Yeah. Um, you know, quite yeah. the employees that have worked for them have worked for them for decades, um, and they want to repay that loyalty. Um, they like to see the brand name survive after after them. 
Um, they might like the building to survive because perhaps it was one that they chose or their dad chose or something like that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other motivations that then start to kick in with the baby boomer generation because when they're faced with working another five years and you're 70 years old, well, that's not terribly appealing. Yeah. Or 1.6 times earnings up front, well, that's not terribly appealing. Yeah. So perhaps if you could get a bit more than 1.6 times earnings, but you have to wait for it a little yeah. bit, that might, more, that might be more appealing on the basis that the company's going to survive, everybody's going to keep their jobs. Yeah. Um, your, 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 your name, your brand, the get on, they have a fresh... Uh, energy into it. So actually all those baby dreamers would be happier to get that business into a safe pair of hands yeah. than they would to yeah. either sell it or, or you know, wind but, it down. But question, and Jeremy, and there are <laughs> what happens, because obviously what? these small businesses are, are, are run by these baby boomer people. What happens when you remove yeah. that what? person? You need somebody in there that's going to run the yeah. business on a day. How do you get past yeah, that? Yeah, so basically, yeah, so basically we look for um, two specific types of business. So the, uh, the kind of opportunistic ones tend to be between half a million and five million in revenue. Yeah. Um, and the more strategic deals that we look at tend to be between one and 10 million of annual profit. Yeah. Um, now, the reason we specifically choose those uh, sizes of business is that they tend to have that depth of, of management and, uh, and other people involved in the business that can continue to run it. Because what you don't want to do is just buy yourself a job. Yeah. So the, you know, the, the um, uh, the, the half a million to five million revenue ones, typically we're using those to bolt onto an existing business to help it grow, um, or it's just opportunistic. It's, an, it's a business that you can pick up and you can flip and sell on to someone else, maybe a competitor or um, you know, per, put it into a roll-up and start to acquire other businesses in the same uh, space, that sort of thing. The one million to ten million um, profit uh, businesses, again, the management team in those ones quite often stay um, and we help them grow through acquisition and everything else. They're really looking for a way to get liquidity in the future um, and, you know, take a bit of money off the table. So historically, you know, Berkshire Hathaway was very good at that in the US. So if you had that family firm doing 10 million a year of profit, Berkshire Hathaway would buy you. Um, you'd carry on running it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, but you'd have that liquidity. You'd have the, you know, some money that you could yeah. take off the table and you yeah. could do some other things with. But the, the brand was protected, the thing was protected. Well, Berkshire Hathaway have now evolved to the state where minimum transaction size is about half a billion. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. those small family firms don't have an actual home anymore like a, like a Berkshire Hathaway. So that was one of the gaps that we try and fill with, uh, with agglomeration. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get into that a bit later. Now, uh, in your Harbour Club right. courses, you... you, you, you go through different cases that you've you've actually implemented this one of the ones that you yep. talked about uh, in one of your videos was when you bought a gym and spa for 3.2 million for for no money uh, can you tell us a yeah, bit about because so, because that, that's a practical example can you can you tell us that yeah, story? So, actually, so actually no the guy who founded it spent the 3.2 million so um basically um they had where, where was uh, this was this in the us or was this in the uk yeah no it's in the uk UK. It was uh, in Watford in Hertfordshire. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it was slap bang in the high street in Watford in Hertfordshire. You know, like a fitness first type, this style of uh, of gym. Um, it was that. It was that kind of place. So it was on the. It was on the first floor. It was fifteen thousand square feet. Um, the guy had spent three point two million fitting it out. He had three uh, three gyms. He'd created like a small chain. Um, so he created. He had three of these gyms. Um, the other two were freehold premises. The, uh, the, uh, this one was a, a leasehold premises, but he yeah, spent 3.2 million fitting it out. It had a uh, lovely marble you know, reception area, wooden paneled lockers. It had steam sauna jacuzzi in the, in the wet area, um, 160 pieces of techno gym uh, equipment, um, you know, all the, the weights and stuff, yeah. the studio. I mean, yeah. it was absolutely beautiful. It was a really, so why really was lovely place. Why was he the guy I, I described it as... Well, so yeah, what happened was um, basically um, he'd invested a lot in the gym at the beginning, um, and uh, and uh, for the first two years the membership grew really quickly because it was new and it was interesting. Yeah. Then what tends to happen with gyms is you start to get um, attrition, um, so you have to constantly bring new things in, new classes, new equipment, new yeah. you know new stuff to get yeah. people excited course, about yeah. the gym again. More from his perspective, he was he was a real estate investor yeah. and he'd seen this as a way of getting a better yield on his real estate. Yeah. So he was a bit of a penny pincher when it came to the, the constant reinvestment thing. And so he decided not to keep reinvesting and just to see what happened. Yeah. And the membership started to take yeah. off. Now, with a gym where you have um, 
uh, you know, high fixed costs. So you have your rent, your rates, your insurance, your staffing. I mean, it's open all the time. Yeah. They have incredible staffing costs. Um, so you have this huge overhead to start with. So there's a, a very clear break-even point where when you get below a certain number of members, it doesn't make money anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what happened is it had gone below that, uh, those, that membership level, and it wasn't making money anymore. So he put all three gyms up for sale. Um, now, another leisure operator had, bought, had decided they wanted to buy two of the gyms because they had the freehold premises plus the catchment area for the Watford gym uh, meant that uh, they already had a gym that covered that area, so they didn't they didn't yeah. want that one. So they basically bought the other two, and this one became a bit of an orphan, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and it was losing money. So it was it was technically insolvent. It was not able to pay bills and things when they were due. Um, so actually, we bought the business through an administration process, mm-hmm. um, and through that administration process, we were able to do a deal that didn't require any money up front. Um, and in fact, we timed the deal so that it was on the last day of the month because we collected all of the membership revenues on the first day of the following month. So we were able to start with cash in the bank because we collected all of that membership uh, revenue on day one um, and then effectively execute a bit of a turnaround plan um, on, on the gym itself. So, um, yeah, it was a great it was a great trophy asset because it looked amazing, you know. Yeah. So you could bring, uh, you know, I had loads of meetings there. So when I was meeting other people, I'd always say, "I'll meet at my my you know health club. This is the yeah. address," and I'd have all the meetings there because people would go, "Oh wow, this is yours." I was only like twenty something years old, so people were like really uh, yeah. really impressed. It was shit business, but it looked great. <laughs> so, yeah. it was, uh, so, so when yeah. you turn that around, what did you do? You put different management in there. I mean, how did you actually turn yeah. it around? There was a great lesson, uh, a great lesson there. So, I mean, um, I had 11 other businesses at the time. So I had, you know, all sorts of other things that, that were taking up um, um, time. We had in total, I think we were up, we had about 135 staff and about um, 15 of those were in the gym. So it was a small part of my little empire that I was building. And I was in, at that time in my life, I was in the empire building phase. So in my mind, it was, um, you know, uh, buy companies, take income from them, buy another one, take income from that. I hadn't discovered exits at this point, which is really the the, the, the sexy bit. You don't make money when you run businesses, you make money when you sell them. And that was the thing, that was the thing I was yet to learn at this point in my career. And so um, uh, and so basically we actually got an offer from Fitness First yeah. about 18 months in uh, for 900 grand um, to buy the gym. Um, and we said no, or I said no, um, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I was empire building and I liked my trophy asset. Yeah. Um, and in my side, I should have taken that with both hands um, yeah. because actually I think it was about 2003 or something like that that I bought that I bought the gym. I was obviously taking income from it every month for, for the whole time. Yeah. But in 2009, so in 2008, if you remember, there was this yeah. little financial yeah. went on the, you know, yeah, the world zone asshole. Yeah. And um, the first quarter of 2009, so bear in mind that um, gyms sign up between 60 and 70% of their total membership in January. Yeah. So if you look at all the members that sign up in a year, 60 to 70% of that all signs up in, in January. January 2009, we actually went backwards in membership. So instead of signing up this huge glut of new members for the year, we actually lost members in January 2009. And it was... Um, I mean, Fitness First actually ended up closing uh, um, several hundred gyms during that period because everyone in the industry felt the same. It was um, uh, it was the discretionary spend. You know, people had discretionary spend; they were cancelling it or not renewing it. Um, and so, this was one of those discretionary spend things that didn't happen. So, actually, um, uh, I ended up um, uh, I ended up selling the business for, uh, or effectively swapping the business for a con- Contracts for another business that I gave them in exchange for them giving a contract with another company that I own. Um, so um, uh, it was effectively I gave it away. I mean, I, I got value from it uh, for the contract that I got, and I also got uh, the years of income that I took from it. Um, but I gave up the 900 grand capital event, which yeah. I now know in hindsight is the. Uh, is kind of the secret to wealth. You know, if you what you earn, you can spend it. Um, whereas capital drives passive income, and it's a passive income that comes from capital properly deployed that really gives you the financial freedom. It's not the income that gives you the financial freedom, it's the passive income that gives you the financial uh, freedom. But, um, but yeah. Do, okay. uh, 
sometimes uh, the, the lessons are good, the school fees aren't so fun. Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Now, in your, in your courses, you talk about the importance of shareholder value, and you have this, this approach where you're teaching people yeah. the importance of shareholder value. Can, can you sort of tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I think um, most people in business, you know, when you start as an entrepreneur, um, any kind of business startup is very much focused on customer value. You have to create a product, you have to create a marketing message, a brand, um, a culture with your staff, a culture with your customers, all of that stuff. That's all customer value related stuff. And quite often entrepreneurs forget to look at shareholder value, which is how am I going to become wealthy from creating this business? And so I always encourage people to um, try and make that shift. Once you've gone through that startup phase, to try and make that shift from customer value to shareholder value. Because actually, entrepreneurs are great at starting things and, and adapt really well to change. In fact, we, we thrive on change. Um, our staff, our customers, they don't like change quite as much as we do. In fact, it, it tends to alienate them quite a bit. So uh, there is a point where the entrepreneur needs to get out of the way of their own business um, and become more strategic. And the question I normally ask to people is, what do you do on a daily basis? Because what you should be doing on a daily basis is talking to people about joint ventures, mergers, acquisitions, or exits. And if you're talking about pretty much anything else, then it's probably staff and customers. It's probably mm -hmm. uh, still at that customer value end of it. And so it's a, it's a really important transition to move away from being a business uh, runner to being a business owner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. <laughs> now, you also talk about this agglomeration system that you've developed, uh, which is quite unique, yeah. where you've got this public company and you've got all these other smaller companies can you explain that, how that works? Because I thought that was very, very yeah, clever. Absolutely. So I mean, obviously, I'm, I was running around the world doing deals, um, buying and selling companies, of, and, I, and I've done deals in 12 different uh, countries. So the great thing about the Harvard Club tactics is they, they, but they're based on human nature, which is very similar everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I was running around doing all these deals, and I noticed that there were loads of really great companies we would come across that did actually have that many options open to them. So these were businesses that are well-run, profitable, debt-free, generating a million plus of annual profits. And yet, if they wanted to borrow money from the bank, they had to bet their house. Yeah. If they wanted to get VC, um, yeah. or they needed to be in some super sexy industry, if, you know, way too small for private equity. Yeah. Um, and it just surprised me that these great businesses didn't have loads and loads of options because having run businesses myself, I know how hard it is to get a business to that sort of scale. Um, and so it struck me as, you know, almost unfair that there, there, there wasn't, you know, lots of opportunities for these kind of businesses. Now, they would afford their owners a decent lifestyle and they would have, you know, uh, a nice income, but that can also be a trap. You know, when you're making a million of annual profits, you don't really want to rock the boat too much. So you don't, you don't do the stretch goals. You don't push things, you know, push yourself too hard because you get a bit comfortable and yeah. comfort's very dangerous sometimes. But, um, but anyway, uh, I thought, look, there's all these great companies, and uh, and they're a bit they're, they're a bit stuck. And I'm living here in Singapore, and I am surrounded by money. I mean, literally, I'm in the, I live in the central business district, so it's the third largest financial center in the world after New York and London. I'm surrounded by money, and there is so much money here, and yet it doesn't find its way into small to medium sized businesses. And as we discussed earlier, small to medium sized businesses are half the economy. Yeah. So why is it that 100 percent of the money in the world? doesn't go into 50% of all the value that's created in the world or 50% of all the, uh, the GDP in the world. And it just struck me as being really weird that money is completely detached from effectively real people. Yeah. You know, the people that yeah. create jobs, pay taxes, do all this stuff. I mean, big companies don't pay tax and um, they always try and get rid of staff. Small businesses are constantly employing people and, uh, and pay all their taxes. So it, it struck me as... Uh, yeah, very strange that this was, uh, this was detached. So I kind of looked at why. Why does smart money or big money not get involved in small business? And it basically comes down to three reasons. The first one is uh, they're too risky. So if they lose a couple of key staff members or a couple of key customers, it's a terrible year. It might be their last year. Um, they suffer from scale. Now, they scale in two ways here. The first one is what I call the scale paradox, which is you have to be big to get big. You can only win the big sexy contracts when you're already big and you can only get decent payment processing and banking facilities when you're already big. So that creates a glass ceiling that stops businesses from becoming big. But the other part of scale is from the investor standpoint. These uh, investors need to deploy millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, sometimes billions or even trillions of dollars. Um, and you can't do that in small business. You can't stick a trillion dollars into a 
uh, you know, shoe shop pop business. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, shoe, yeah local and, shoe shop. Yeah, <laughs> get any kind of reasonable return. So they suffer from the scale that you can't deploy the levels of capital that you need to into. And then the final one, so risk was the first, scale was the second. The final one is liquidity. And liquidity is always overlooked by business owners because business owners don't tend to also be investors. So um, you know, entrepreneurs tend to be constantly betting the farm and rolling over. So you don't often find wealthy entrepreneurs. But when, you're, when you speak to an investor, one of the key things investors look for is liquidity. So the ability to get the money back out of an investment relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. So when you invest in a S&P 500, for example, um, you can invest in the morning and divest in the afternoon. So, you know, Trump tweets something, you can yeah. buy, sell according to yeah. uh, whatever that tweet said. Yeah. Um, so you can reposition very easily. If you invest in a small business, you're probably going to be stuck with that investment for the next two election cycles. You know, we could be a communist country by the time you actually have the opportunity yeah. to exit that, uh, yeah. that, you know, that, that investment. And so investors don't want to sit around for five or ten years in an investment. They want the ability to, to get in and out. So private equity have typically tried to solve this problem using what's called a roll-up. And a roll-up is very simply where you buy a load of companies and you stick them all together. You get some 20-something-year-old uh, MBAs to go in and, uh, you know, find all the synergies and fix all the things that you can fix. It's not normally done with tons of debt, so you borrow loads of money um, and give it to the, the previous owners. And by the way, I always say that, you know, leverage buyouts using debt to buy small to medium-sized companies is really toxic um, because you're effectively taking your future cash flow and you're giving it to your star employee so they can leave. Um, and that, as a mix, can be very, very toxic. And also, remember, the people running these businesses are often doing the job of three people for the salary of half a person, so they're really hard to replace as well. So um, uh, so private equity normally tries to borrow loads of money, put them all together, and those deals work reasonably well with big transactions, um, but they don't work very well with owner-managed businesses, these ones that I'm talking about with the one to 10 million of profits, because... Those businesses often have a unique culture that they've created with their staff and their customers. Mm-hmm. That means you can't just put two of them mm-hmm. together and get, you know, more than four. Uh, you can't put two plus two and get more than four because, uh, yeah, the, the, that culture doesn't necessarily homogenize yeah. um, terribly well. Yeah. However, there is a huge valuation arbitrage between the value of a small private company and a large public one. Yeah. So, uh, for example, if you look at that business by itself, I mentioned the engineering company being at 1.6 times um, earnings. If you look at a public listed large engineering firm, it might be 16 to 25 times earnings, so 10 to 15 times the valuation. Um, and what is a large engineering company if it's not 20 small ones put together? Yeah. Um, so, effectively, you can create an, an awful lot of value um, if you can leverage that arbitrage between small private and large public company. So the, the solution that we came up with, because we felt that you know the traditional roll-up doesn't work because um, you don't capture all of that uh, value. So what we decided the better way to do was for uh, effectively all of the um, uh, entrepreneurs, these smart, smart, smart private businesses, effectively they do a uh, they buy a public company between them. Um, and they buy the public company using their own shares. So effectively, they swap their private shares for public company shares. Um, that creates. So do they put a hundred percent? So do they put a hundred percent? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's actually a, if you use the kind of financial industry parlance, they're going public by reverse merger. So a, mer- a mer- the simplest way to look at a merger is it's an acquisition using shares instead of cash. So it's a no money down. A merger is a no money down deal. A reverse merger is normally where um, uh, instead of buying something using your own shares, you end up being a subsidiary of that company using your own shares. So you're reversing into that vehicle. Now, there are two main purposes people use reverse mergers. One is to go public, like like we're talking about, and the other is the tax inversions, which you might might remember from a couple of when when Obama was in power. So so, so, so let me see if I got it right here. So if you've got 10 companies, okay, and they're all like shoe shop, uh, this, that, the other, all these small businesses... They all turn yep. all their shares, 100% of their shares, into this larger company, and they own, let's say, 10% each. Correct. Okay. And then that larger company is quite yeah, yeah, but they now exactly they now have public listed shares. So if they, you know, uh, when you have a private company, if you want to sell one percent of your company and buy a Porsche, you can't really do that. Whereas with a public company, you can. You can sell a few shares and go buy yourself something nice. Yeah. Um, so they have the liquidity. They now have the lower risk profile because a portfolio of small businesses is stronger than in an individual yeah. um, small business. Uh, and there are also obvious synergies that exist between them that they can uh, extract. But, but Jeremy, how do, you, how do you, because obviously if these 10 people are now going to put all their, their companies into one, 
they have to meet with each yep. other, don't they? They have to. You have to sort of choose yeah, the, uh, choose these people carefully so, that they're going to get along. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we focus on uh, well-established, profitable, debt-free, well-run uh, companies. Yeah. History of making profit, more than a million a year of profit, and um, and the most important thing is we have this agglomeration structure. So, agglomeration is a is, is a patented um, system by us. Um, and it's uh, effectively a governance structure. Um, it took us two years to get this approved by the FCA in the UK, well, actually the UKLA in the UK, to be able yeah. to take this public. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but effectively, it's a governance structure that allows these companies the autonomy to continue to run their business on a decentralized basis, okay. but a framework okay. around how they cooperate together and how decisions are made as a group. Um, and it's that framework that really is the, uh, the, the kind of, the big value uh, in this is this ability for them to yeah cooperate together and create uh, shareholder value uh, together. So how many so, um, how many have you done of these? Awesome. How, we how listed many? a company called MBH Corporation. So, sorry, on, how, sorry. Many, how many of these have you created now? Well, so we're just doing the first um, uh, uh, kind of main market listed uh, version of uh, of agglomeration, and this is a diversified investment holding group. So it has. Um, groups of businesses in different sectors. So the one that we uh, it, we listed it just over a year ago, it's called MBH Corporation PLC. So you can find the ticker on Bloomberg as M8, the number eight and H, and then it's usually .gr or .d, depending on what part of the world uh, you're in, but MBH is the ticker for the, for the stock. MBH. Um, okay. And basically, uh, a year ago, it's now doing um, in pounds sterling Terms is about 110 million a year in revenue, about 11 million in profits. That's after just one year. So, so does it pay uh, a dividend? Uh, 11 <laughs> does this stock pay a dividend? Uh, yeah, so it comes out, uh, the, the first annual report comes out in March, which is a couple of months from the date yeah. of this recording. Yeah. And the uh, board of directors have already signaled in all of their um, kind of communications with the market that they will be paying a dividend. Wow, um, nice. They will use surplus cash to pay dividends. So actually, if you look at it, we grew 187% in 2019. So we've grown 187% and pay a dividend. So are we a growth stock or are we a dividend stock? It's um, it's quite an interesting, uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, kind of story. But that first year, we've kind of been in stealth mode. We've just been adding companies and, and doing stuff. And then I, I think after that, after the annual results and the first dividend, is when we'll really start marketing the uh, uh, the share and talking yeah. about the great story yeah. that there is because we wanted to we wanted to sell what we've done, not what we're about to do. Um, yeah. uh, you know, from a yeah. selling, so, selling so, market perspective. Yeah. But we'll add another we'll add another fifteen to twenty companies during twenty twenty as well. So there's are they all in the UK? Are all these companies? No, they're all over the place. So um, actually, there's a, there's a lot in the UK. So, uh, so the target markets are Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, UK, Europe. Uh, US and Canada. Um, at the moment, we've done quite a few in the UK, plus uh, New Zealand and Singapore. Um, so um, uh, we have different verticals. So we have an education uh, vertical, which has got a number of companies in uh, in the UK. Um, we're the number one uh, trainer of kindergarten teachers in the UK, um, as well as um, uh, providing software as a service to about a third of the kindergartens in the UK. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, vocational training in other industries um, as well through the education uh, business. Um, we have a facilities management and property services uh, group, um, which is a number of companies that does very high value work. They've just done stuff for Fortnum and Masons, Buckingham Palace. Um, they did the they did the most Instagrammed bar in London, which is the one of the stock the old stock exchange building in in London was one of our projects. Um, there's uh, yeah some uh, they do a lot of the Grosvenor Estate um, and uh, Belgravia and all that lot. Um, we've got an engineering services group within there. We've only got one company at the moment, but a, but a pipeline of new companies potentially joining there as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's diversified across countries, across currencies, across product services, markets. So um, we we really leverage that portfolio uh, approach with these uh, uh, with these businesses. So, did you build this with all your Harbour Club people? They've all helped you build this together. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, indeed. So I took uh, I took a company public um, in 2018. Um, uh, as a SPAC, it's called a special purpose acquisition company. So effectively, it's like a shell company that you take public. Yeah. And then we use that as a vehicle to roll all of these other businesses um, uh, into. And many of those were introduced by uh, Harbour Clubbers. So we do it on a joint venture basis. Yeah. Um, so we create you know, quite a bit of value all around, not only for the business owners, but for Harbour Clubbers and for ourselves as well. Um, and we've now, you know, we're now 
hitting into 2020 with a huge pipeline of opportunities. In fact, I put out a video recently saying that the goal for 2020 is to create 50 new dollar millionaires um, in 2020 um, using the Harbour Club uh, strategies. And we're going to be documenting these and publishing the bank statements and the case studies for all of those deals throughout uh, 2020. Um, We're just working on the first five of those right now. So hopefully we'll be able to announce five new millionaires pretty soon. Um, and yeah, the goal, it's a stretch goal. <laughs> the goal is 50 yeah. by the end of the year. Yeah, why not? Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Super. Okay, now, uh, just to slightly change the subject. Now, we've, there's a lot of talk right now about this Brexit thing happening in the UK. The, obviously, this year, the US have got uh, their election. A um, lot of talk about President Trump being re-elected, but, you know, the economy in the US has, has really improved a lot over the last three and a half years. Yeah. Um, Brexit is a bit of uncertainty and whatever. Now, um, it looks like, President Trump's going to be re-elected, so continue what he's been doing. Um, and it looks like Brexit's about to happen here in the UK. How do you think this is going to affect the markets in the US and the UK? And how is this going to affect the rest of the world? And we see, for example, in Taiwan, they just recently had their election and they elected somebody for the people, a bit like the Brexit and the Trump thing. So it looks like there's, there's yeah. this power to the people effect going out throughout the world. How do you think this is going to create yeah. more business opportunities? Yeah, so look, I've always looked at, you know, um, government and regulation as the ropes around the boxing ring and the fight goes on in the middle. Um, And so they can move the ropes wherever they like and the fight just carries on going on on the middle. And and you can't really choose where they put the ropes. You just have to fight in the bit of space that you have uh, um, available to you. And what I've often found is that, you know, people people always want to look at the the, the glass being half empty. Um, And they always want to look at what the downsides of everything are. And so if, you, if you're just quietly optimistic and you get on with what you're doing, you'll often find that there's loads of opportunities that you can take advantage of while other people are, are miserable and, and crying about it. And if you look at the amount of energy people have expended on the topics of Trump and Brexit, and these are people that have absolutely no influence over the actual outcomes or things that would happen going forward. These aren't you know, political candidates or opposition leaders or anything like this. This is ordinary people that seem to have devoted their lives to disagreeing with some other people. Um, If that level of energy was just applied to something even vaguely positive for their own life, just imagine what they could accomplish. (laughs) Yeah, I I agree. I agree. It's such a it's such a waste of oxygen. It's uh, it's frightening. But um, but that that's you know. The, of course, the rules will keep changing. I actually like dynamic uh, environments where the rules are changing quite a bit because that's where a lot of opportunities come. Yeah. You know, I think the reason yeah. there was so much objection to Brexit was because it kind of uh, creates opportunities for small disruptive businesses to take a big slice of large companies' pies. And large companies are the CBI and the advisors yeah. to government. So, of course, they're obviously against anything other than the status quo because they can't react quickly. They can't, they're not as nimble as you know, entrepreneurial small businesses. So I'm all for things that help entrepreneurial small businesses and change and disruption actually helps entrepreneurial small businesses um, quite a bit. So I, I think it, it's going to be very interesting times. Um, it's very interesting times to be equipped with the tools to be able to, to do deals yes. um, because yes. there are so many deals out there. Uncertainty just pushes people toward doing deals um, you know, quicker. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think make hay while the sun shines. Yeah. Okay. Now you're yeah. living in Singapore. Okay. You've been in Singapore for a number of years now. Uh, tell us a bit about the business opportunities in that part of the world. Now, obviously, there's a lot of talk about China, but you know, there's not just China in your region. Uh, there's lots of other economies there, from Vietnam to Taiwan to Japan and, and Philippines, Indonesia. Uh, now you're living right there in in one of the three top financial capitals of the world. Uh, what type of uh, what's the atmosphere there out now? What's what's the buzz? What are people talking about? What are the ones to what? What are the economies and the different industries to look for in that particular region? Because it's the fastest growing region in the world. More millionaires and new billionaires are being created than any other place in the planet on the planet. Uh, and the Asia Pacific region is 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 the place where there's going to be major growth over the next few years. So tell us a bit about your yeah. experience there right now, because you're you're there. You've got your ear to the ground. Uh, you're seeing and hearing things that maybe we don't hear, hear, or, hear or see on the news. Over to you. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Asia doesn't get that much on the news. I mean, in fact, if you were drawing the world map and you based it on population, um, you know, Singapore would probably be where the UK is on all those maps. It would be there, right, right in the centre, because you know, if you uh, if you draw a five-hour flying radius from Singapore, you get to two-thirds of the people on the planet. 
you know, so there's seven billion people on the planet. Two thirds of them are five hours flight from Singapore. Yeah. Um, so it really yeah. is the center of, uh, of everything. And in fact, you know, Macau and Hong Kong have been positioning themselves as kind of financial centers as well, you know, for a very long time. Um, but, you know, with all the China influence in Hong Kong um, and all the European influence in Switzerland and all the U.S. influence, in the Caribbean, yeah. um, Singapore is really, the, you know, gravitating to become a really, really major financial center. Like you said, it's the third largest financial center now. And a lot of that is Swiss family offices that are opening and, uh, and people that would have traditionally gone to the Caribbean. The, the challenge with the Caribbean, you know, with, um, you know, British Virgin Islands or, um, you know, Cayman Islands or all those usual suspects is that actually there is nothing there. You know, it, it is a, a, a copper nameplate on a wall. Um, and it's a convenience thing. Well, obviously, the way tax avoidance and things are moving um, is they're looking more for a center of commercial interest. And, and Singapore is not a no-tax environment. It's a low-tax environment. Um, but there's a real reason to be here. It's got stuff to do. There's, you know, there's, a, there's a city. There's a vibrancy. There's, you know, it's, it's a real place. So um, uh, it makes a lot more sense than perhaps some of those traditional um, centers that people used to use for registering uh, their companies. But no, it's huge. It's a hugely exciting time. It has been for a long time. Look, we are actually in a fairly stagnant period of growth right now. Growth levels here aren't uh, aren't what they were. Um, but just the sheer scale of the population in the region and the growth, um, you know, I mean, Philippines is very close by. That's got one of the fastest growing populations in the world. Uh, Indonesia is right next door. People don't realize Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world. It's the fourth largest uh, population. I can see it from my house. It's over here. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's really, really booming. And, and all of those countries that go through that transition from basically being poor to um, building out their middle class are massive economic drivers. Um, and as you drag people out of poverty, it creates huge opportunities and huge economic uh, um, you know, development in those businesses and in those areas. So, uh, yeah, it is, it is a really exciting time. There's lots of things to do. I mean, actually, the, the strategy that I adopt at the moment uh, doesn't fully leverage that because I, I adopt the strategy of targeting mature uh, one arm edge of, uh, of growth. So I look at Australia, New Zealand, the UK, US, Canada, yeah. um, because I'm looking at the baby boomer yeah. opportunity and, and yeah. you know, the, the other end of it. Yeah. Certainly, you know, deploying capital and things like that, um, uh, and investment, um, you know, this region is very, very exciting. Yeah, and it also seems to me that they, they tend to implement new technology a lot quicker in your uh, region than they sorry, do in other parts of the world. Yeah, wait, I think we, we got disconnected. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> We did cut off a little bit there, yeah. Sorry, what did you say? Yeah, I was saying about uh, technology. They, they tend to uh, implement yeah. new technology quicker in your part of the world than they do in, in Europe or in the US, for example. Yeah, and, and actually the you know the funding and things like that uh, uh, for it are, are there as well. So I mentioned the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund in our kind of chat before yeah. we started, and uh, and the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund you know backs local tech and then drives it into the region. Um, and uh, so they, you know they they've had some wonderful um, success stories. I mean, so for example, Changi Airport is the most successful airport in the world, and uh, and always gets voted number. Yeah. Airport. Yeah. Um, so the Changi Group then got the backing yeah. from Marsac, which is the Sovereign Wealth Fund, yeah. to go and sell airports to new countries. So all these developing countries in the region who want new airports, the Changi Group builds their airports yeah. uh, for them and then manages them and yeah. then provides facilities for them. So um, they're building smart cities in India and in China. So India and China are, you know, going through this massive rapid growth where they're taking people out of fields and into skyscrapers, um, uh, and they want to do that in a sustainable, manageable way. And so um, Singapore are actually building cities in India and China um, for, uh, yeah, for, for people to live in. So, it, yeah, it, it really is, yeah, they're, they're, they're smart here. Yeah, good, good. Okay, Jeremy, yeah. thank you very much for uh, this, this great, uh, these great insights that you've, uh, that you've shared with us today. Um, if people want to find out more about you in the Harbour Club, where, where do they need to go? Yeah. yeah, so if you want to find out about the Harbour Club, um, you can go to um, harbourclubevents.com or you can go to harbourclubusa.com if you're in the US or, or Canada. And it's Harbour spelled in the English way, so H-A-R-B-O-U-R. So it's yeah. got a U in there. Yeah, well, um, the Americans don't always yeah. remember remember yeah um you can also follow on instagram we post loads of videos on instagram uh, it's harbor.jeremy 
yeah. or on Twitter, Jeremy, uh, at Jeremy J Harbour. Yeah. Um, so uh, we post lots of videos and content there. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, YouTube, obviously, under, under the Harbour Club. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can find lots of, uh, lots of content. Actually, I can do something for your, uh, for your listeners that's a little bit special, if you like. We've got a book called Go Do Deals. Yeah. Um, now, it's been published in December uh, 2020, and as we're recording this in January at the moment, so it's yeah. been uh, published in December 2020. At the moment, you only get a copy if you come on the, on the Harbour Club. Yeah. Um, but what I will do is if somebody goes onto the harbourclubevents.com website yeah. and um, yeah. downloads our PDF report on how to buy companies without using a cash or debt and takes a photo of that and, yeah. and tags us on Instagram, yeah. I will send you at my expense, I'll yeah. pay the postage, and I'll send you a copy of Go Do Deals, the unpublished book that you can only normally get on, on the Hard Club. I don't want to give it to everybody, I'll only give it to people that jump through the hoop. Um, yeah, makes but sense. Uh, if, it's topic, if it's a topic that you're interested in, download the free report, which I think you'll find interesting anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, take a picture, a picture of you having downloaded that and, and tag us on Instagram and I'll send you a copy of the book at my... Uh, at my expense, so uh, that's something that uh, you can't get anywhere else. Um, but uh, yeah, you can only get it. I, I, I posted a video recently. You can only get a copy of the book if you're a head of state or if you're uh, a come on. Yeah, I saw that. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. on your yacht. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, thank you so, very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, see you soon. So, well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jeremy Harbour and the freebie that he's going to be sending to all of you that uh, do what he said, uh, putting it on Instagram and that, downloading that file, and he'll send you a copy of his new book, which is very, very interesting. So I encourage you all to do that. I encourage you to subscribe to Quantum Action. Also, go and have a look at the video on the Action Cube, where I explain the different sides of the, the cube, and uh, we'll be doing out here on Quantum Action over the next few weeks and months. So um, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Uh, give us comment below, give us a thumbs up. That's all from Fabrizio Poli on Quantum Action. And now it's really down to you to get, go out there, take on board what Jeremy had to say and take action. Or should I say quantum action? <laughs>